Good morning. Welcome to another daily devotional here in Grimmel Street Presbyterian Church. If you're a visitor, you're very welcome indeed. And we pray that God will bless us again this morning as we look at his word. Let's just open with a word of prayer. Father, we give you thanks for this day. We thank you for the opportunity we have to, to turn to your word. We uh, are free to do so, unlike so many of our brothers and sisters uh, around the world. And not only are we free to look at your word and to turn to your word, but we have your word in various uh, translations of our own language. And we, we thank you for that, for the, the freedom and the, the heritage that is ours through those who have uh, walked this way before us in this part of the world. And we pray that wherever we are listening this morning, that you would bless each one of us and help us each to focus our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. For we pray in his name. Amen. Uh, previously we looked at Psalm 1. I want to this morning look at Psalm 2. Uh, and I'm going to read from Psalm 2. Uh, so this is the word of God. Why do the nations conspire and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Let us break their chains, they say, and throw off their fetters. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will proclaim the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask of me and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You will rule them with an iron scepter and you will dash them to pieces like pottery. Therefore, you kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you be destroyed in your way, for his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Amen. Psalm 2, as you're probably aware, is what is known as a messianic psalm. It's a psalm that speaks of a coming Messiah. Um, it is particularly messianic, as is Psalm 16, Psalm 110, and a few others. But of course, all of Scripture speaks of a coming Messiah. But uh, this psalm speaks of the, the Messiah who, of course, was the son of David, the, the son of man, uh, the son of God. It uh, was written, this psalm was written by David, uh, although it doesn't have a title. Um, we know that from reading in Acts chapter 4, when uh, the believers came to pray on the release of Peter and John from prison. They used this psalm and said it came from their father David. So, uh, it's a, a psalm written by David, therefore uh, it is written uh, about 1,000 years approximately before the birth of Jesus Christ. And it looks forward not only to that coming, but also to the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. How trustworthy is the word of God? How unlike uh, the word of men is our Bible? It is trustworthy, it is accurate, it is true, and it is something that we can completely rely upon. And Psalm 2 uh, begins by setting uh, the kings and nations in opposition to a holy God. The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Let us break their chains, they say, and threw off their fetters. But it is futile for the nations of the earth to rebel against the Lord and to reject his authority. We know that from reading through scripture and we know that from this psalm in particular. when Because he rules over all. Um, the one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion Hill. You see, in the first coming of Christ, we know that he came um, uh, as uh, a, a, a Messiah 
he came gentle and riding on a donkey on the foal of an ass. We know from uh, prophets like Isaiah uh, in his suffering servant passage that he, uh, a bruised reed he would not break, a smouldering wick he would not snuff out. We know from the record in the Gospels that when he was sentenced to death he did not open his mouth. He was that suffering servant of God who came to take away our sin. And we know that this was all part of God's plan. It was not, uh, if you like, uh, the Romans who were responsible for his death. It was not um, the Jews who were responsible for his death. It was the Father who was responsible for his death. This is love, says John, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. As Paul writes to the Corinthians, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And we know that there is no salvation outside of this Messiah, outside of this Christ. There is only one way to the Father, and that is through the Son. And uh, his sacrifice, of course, we also know, was a once-for-all sacrifice for sins. And we know, we know that, as we looked uh, at, at Psalm 1 and other passages of Scripture, that this uh, salvation is for all who will believe. Yet, uh, we also know that uh, it's for all nations, it's for all peoples. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. We are all one in Christ Jesus. God is not a respecter of persons. It's for all who will believe. But of course we need to remind ourselves that not everyone will be saved. Um, the majority actually will be lost. It's an alarming fact uh, to know that, that the majority are going to a lost eternity. But it is a fact and it is a fact through the lips of no less a person than Jesus Christ himself in the Sermon on the Mount. You know, many people who are not believing uh, Christians uh, hold with some fondness the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the peacemakers, blessed are, uh, you know, the, the poor and so on. But in that Sermon on the Mount, Jesus actually says, wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it, but small is the gate, and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. And we see this, don't we, in this psalm, because it looks not only to the coming Messiah uh, who came uh, as a, as a saviour, but it also looks to the second coming, it looks to the end times. It speaks of a victorious Christ over rebellious kings and nations. Ask of me, it says in verse 8, and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You will rule them with an iron scepter. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. And this is what awaits Christ on his return when he finally defeats all the enemies of God. You can read about it in some detail, if you like, in Revelation chapter 19 and into chapter 20. It is not a pretty picture, but we have to say that justice will be served on that day of the Lord. God, you see, cannot overlook sin. Sin must and will be punished and every enemy of our holy God and his Christ will be defeated. And as the psalmist says in this psalm, therefore, you kings, be wise, be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you be destroyed in your way, for his wrath can flare up in a moment. 
Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Thankfully, we still live in the gospel age, in the day of grace, those days between his first coming and his second coming, those days in which there is an opportunity to repent and believe the gospel, to trust and believe in Jesus Christ as Saviour and Lord. The psalmist says here, kiss the Son. He could well have said, believe the Son. Believe in the Lord Jesus. When the apostles were asked on one occasion, what must I do to be saved? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. The psalmist here says, kiss the Son lest he be angry and you be destroyed in your way. Interesting, isn't it? As we looked at Psalm 1, we noticed that there was two ways. There was God's way and man's way. And for those who are in their own way, for those who are doing it their way and have no regard for the things of God, have no uh, respect for the cross of Jesus Christ, then they are going to be destroyed in that way. There's only two ways. There's the way of God. As the psalmist in Psalm 1 says, the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. You see, the sun's wrath can flare up in a moment and we would be destroyed in our way were we not to be found in him. One of the commentators on this psalm, I think, sums up the psalm in a very uh, good way when he says, there is no refuge from him. There is only refuge in him. Take refuge in Christ. Trust in him and believe and rest in his assurances that he is with us always, even to the very end of the age. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank you again for the gospel of Jesus Christ. We thank you that we find that gospel in the Psalms. We find that gospel in the Pentateuch. We find it in the prophets. We find it in the history books. We find it in the New Testament. It's all throughout the Bible because it is your word and your word speaks purely about Jesus Christ and his coming as Redeemer and Lord. And we pray, Lord God, that in these days that you would enable each one of us who are listening to this uh, devotional to know that we're in him, that in our way we are overlooked by a holy God uh, or, or looked over by a holy God, uh, watching over our way. We pray, Father, that for those who do not know Christ as Saviour, that in grace and mercy you may allow them to see Jesus Christ for the very first time as their Saviour, dying on the cross to cover their sin and enabling them to put their trust and faith in Christ as Saviour. And to those of us who already know him in that way, help us to focus our eyes on him who is the author and the perfecter of our faith. For we offer this prayer in his name and we pray for his sake. Amen. <laughs>